What color in the garden is often overlooked but sorely missed when left out? Well, it's the color green. We'll take a look at this all-important color coming up next. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to today's show, which is about color, one of my favorite topics. In fact, we're going to focus on the color green because it's one of the most important colors in the garden. But you know, I was checking out the Crayola Crayon research on color preferences, and green ranked only 21st in 50 of the top favorite colors. Well, as a garden designer, I guess it just makes sense that I would think that green ought to rank a little higher. In today's show, we're going to learn some fun facts about color. In fact, I'm going to show you how to make a delicious recipe with these green tomatoes. And we'll learn about flowers that bloom green and how florists are using green to create clean, crisp, and modern arrangements. I'll show you some of the different green plants I use in my garden, including this beauty called Anne Greenaway. And what would a garden be without a bit of structure? I'll show you how important hedges can be in gardens of all sizes. And with that said, we're off to England's Grand Chatsworth Estate, and it's 35,000 acres of grounds right after this. Creating enclosure is an important aspect of the garden home. In fact, I consider it the most important. You see, for me, enclosure is about creating walls that define spaces and garden rooms. Now, one of the grandest examples of creating enclosure is through the miles and miles of hedges that you can find at Chatsworth House in England. During a visit to this beautiful estate, I had to inquire about how they maintain all of these hedges. At the moment, you've got a team of three that's just doing all the hedges. I mean, the hedges you've got around you now. Um, well, there are a lot of hedges here. Yeah, I think, I can't remember the exact figure, something like between seven and 11 miles of hedge. My heaven. Different uh, types, obviously. But uh, yeah, and you've got three guys that do that uh, from July to October, and that's all they do. It takes a lot of scaffolding and ladders and equipment to get up to these heights. I mean, some of these hedges are 15 feet tall. Yeah, some of the, the beach hedges are 15 foot, and they go down to 13 foot. Um, but yeah, and then some, when you cut the maze, the maze is like six, seven foot. So it varies, yeah. But it gets less and less as the, as the year progresses. Here in America, we've traditionally seen enclosure created from hedges and fences. Let me give you a few examples of the way I've used enclosure in my own garden home. In the front garden, I've used a picket fence to provide enclosure. This also allows me to grow climbing roses and vines along the fence. Another example of enclosure is the clipped boxwood hedge in my round or rondelle garden. This hedge creates a low wall that separates the more formal rondelle from the less formal kitchen or vegetable garden. Probably the strongest example of enclosure is in the fountain garden. It's made up of clipped holly hedges. These hedges serve as a strong architectural feature in every season and provide privacy from the street beyond. The style of my garden home is definitely traditional. You see, I took my lead from the house, which is a colonial revival cottage built around the turn of the century. So the style of the garden, well, it's a cottage style. Now, in this garden home, we took a lead from the architecture as well. You see, you always want to look at your house to come up with elements that you can use or incorporate into the garden. You don't want to clash between the styles. For instance, who wants a modern house with a very traditional or colonial garden? It just doesn't fit. Now let's take a closer look at this garden home. It's located on the banks of the Arkansas River. We wanted to evoke the calmness of water and movement of waves in the garden. So how do you achieve a sense of enclosure in a space like this, which is non-traditional and contemporary? Well, I decided to use ornamental grasses. And don't you think they really set the stage for this garden room? While the grasses are light and airy, certainly not solid like my holly hedge, they do provide an intimate feeling. 
In other parts of the garden, we've screened views by using Cryptomeria, a fast-growing evergreen along the fence line. And on the patio, we've placed containers at the edge to bring the garden closer to the home, while adding an element of privacy to a seating area. Up next, a flower show place, where we'll meet up with this beautiful lamium called Anne Greenaway. And I'll tell you why I'm so taken with this stunning ground cover. Welcome back. Now this is a flower show place. What a range of colors and textures. I love visiting places like this and finding new plant introductions that I've not tried before. This is where I first saw Anne Greenaway. Now you see, lamiums make interesting ground covers. Tom Dope, a perennial expert, tells us more about this plant. You know, gardeners are always looking for color for the shade, mm -hmm. and this lamium and greenaway is terrific just for that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's one of those things that you can grow. I mean, you can't grow it in the dark, but as far as growing it in a, in a, in a shady area, it will perform very well. And also, it, it works very well because some lamiums are sort of invasive or they spread out a great That's deal. That's right. Whereas this tends to maintain its, uh, its presence uh, uh, a lot better. And so you can use it well as a border, something like that. And Greenaway has good manners. Well, that's a good way of putting it. That's, it's, it takes care of uh, what you want to do with it. Well, I can see where it would be beautiful with ferns and hosta and impatience. Mm -hmm. And it's hardy. Uh, probably almost anywhere in North America you can grow this. It's hardy, as they say, to zone five, which is the Pennsylvania, Michigan, you know, northern parts of the United States. Uh, and it's a good performer in the south as well. Absolutely. You know, I've used some of the other lamiums in containers such as White Nancy mm -hmm. and Orchid Frost, and the color and pattern of the leaf is so outstanding in lamiums. It's just a natural for both bed and container. Well, it's a striking plant, and it has these little flowers on it that, that provide a little bit of contrast. Uh, but the, the main feature of it is the foliage and the variegation in the foliage, which works very well. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Okay. Enjoy gardening. Hey, you too. Now there's more ahead with a trip down my shady path and tips on some of the plants I'm growing there to give it a lush green look. So stay with us. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. Today we're taking a look at the importance of the color green. Now really, can you imagine a world without green? It would be a pretty bleak place indeed. Well, let's get some color back on the screen. Now earlier we saw how important structure and framework can be in the garden. Evergreens can form boundaries and backdrops for some of our favorite flowering plants. Now one of my favorite evergreens is the boxwood, but we'll get to it later. And we also went to a flower show place where Lamium and Greenaway was on display. She's such a lovely addition to my garden. When I think about the color green, I have to stop and consider the many shades of green that I can find in my shade garden. There are lots of hostas and ferns, Solomon seal, a large rhododendron that blooms in spring, but is evergreen the rest of the year. Then there are hydrangeas that bloom in summer, and the rest of the growing season they have lush green leaves. Now this year I enhanced the shade garden with some large elephant ears and I replaced my cypress arch with a camellia sasanqua hedge. This is the fall blooming camellia. Now along my fence, I've planted holly trees. And if you look down as you walk through the shade garden, you'll notice the chartreuse leaves of Creeping Jenny. It's a fantastic ground cover, not to mention a nice cascading plant for containers. You know, I enjoy discovering new and interesting plants, particularly those I can grow in my own garden and cut as flowers to use in arrangements. One such plant I learned about from a farmer in Holland. Now, Jack, you all have grown gladiola for years and grow millions of them each year, but you also grow new varieties of flowers for the market as well. Yeah, we grow uh, Ornithogallum saunersi. In this so these are all Ornithogalliums? Yeah. yeah, I will cut one. Here you are. It's, uh, it's a plant who needs a lot of uh, heat. A lot of heat. A lot of heat, yeah. Right, so for any sort of warm climate garden, this would be a good garden Perfect. flower. It can't stand uh, frost, so when it's freezing, it's finito. Yeah. And when you plant it, you've got the soil here, you put the bulb on it, and the bulb will pull itself down. Yep, you can see how you've grown them here. Yeah. A little bit of the bulb sticks up. Yeah, but it's, we started up, and now it's going down itself. It's got real strong, uh, roots. strong roots. Yeah. Amazing. 
And you see this flower as having a very bright future. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Now, I mentioned the boxwoods in my garden and how important they are to the overall design and structure. But they also provide an opportunity for my flowers to really be shown off. You see the blooms cast against that solid dark green backdrop as a perfect way to display them. Now, speaking of dramatic displays, I love to pick flowers in my garden and combine them in tight bouquets like this. This is from the summer garden, but you can take this whole idea of combining lots of color together with flowers that you can pick up at the florist. And you can see what I've done here with this basket of flowers. You see, it's made up of six different little vases, and I've just clustered the flowers together, bound them with a rubber band, and placed them in the vase, and they just slide in like so. What a presentation. Now let's get back to boxwoods. There are many different varieties. In my garden, I grow several but two that stand out are English and Korean. The English has more of a pointed leaf and the color is a darker green. The Korean, well its leaf is rounder and the color is slightly more chartreuse or yellow. Now when you prune boxwoods, and believe me, they need a good haircut every now and then, you need to start with a good pair of sharp shears so that when you make the cut, you don't leave any ragged edges on the stems. Now boxwood are a broadleaf evergreen. You can see they're aptly named because they're green throughout the year and the leaves are broad. Broad as opposed to needle-like as you can see in evergreens like spruce, pine, or juniper. These two types of evergreens recover differently after being pruned. You see broadleaf evergreens have dormant buds on their stems. So when you cut a broadleaf evergreen back to these bare stems, what happens is the dormant buds are activated and they soon flush the plant with lots of new green growth. On the other hand, if you try to take a needle type evergreen like this Leyland cypress and cut it back to the bare twigs, don't expect it to flush with new growth. You see all of its new growth buds are found in the green foliage. So if you're pruning some of these needle type evergreens, you may want to take a little lighter hand. Now if you see the leaves on your boxwoods turning slightly yellow, this could be a sign that the plant is suffering from a lack of iron. Now iron is an essential part of the production of chlorophyll. Of course, chlorophyll is what turns a plant's leaf green. But there are a couple of things you can do to correct the problem. You can mix a solution of liquid chelated iron and water and apply it directly to the foliage. Or you can take a granular form and apply it to the base of the plant, and it will absorb it through its roots. If you've diagnosed the problem correctly, you'll probably see positive results in a week or so. Okay, it's time for viewer mail. And today's letter comes from Sarah in Hershey, Pennsylvania. She writes, Alan, most of our backyard is shaded or partially shaded. Can you give us some advice on the kinds of plants we can use in this area? We'd like color in our backyard. Are there plants that we can get that will provide color most of the growing season? Well, Sarah, you're in luck. In fact, there are quite a few to choose from. And there are many that aren't just foliage plants. They'll actually produce beautiful blooms in the shade. Like impatience, there's such a wide range of them available to us, starting with the New Guineas. You can find a myriad of colors, both in terms of bloom and foliage with New Guinea impatience. But the most impressive thing to me about them is that if you compare the standard impatient bloom to that of a New Guinea, the New Guineas are almost three to four times larger. They're impatience for everyone, whether you like blooms large or small. I recently tried a miniature called Firefly that's done very well in my garden. Now, if you want to promote lots of blooms throughout the growing season, it's important to feed them regularly, about every three weeks with an all-purpose liquid fertilizer that's high in phosphorus. One of the design techniques that I use with impatience is to use a lot of the same color in one area, whether it's sweeps of color in a bed or in one large container. Another shade performer is Columbine. It's a perennial, and its flowers look like tiny starbursts with spurs extending from the back of each blossom. When Columbine is in full bloom in my garden, it always turns heads. People can't help but remark on its beauty. Now I like to combine Impatience and Columbine with other shade tolerant plants, such as Spiderwort, Virginia Sweet Spire, as well as the ground cover Lamium. There are more great shade plants listed on my website. That's pallensmith.com. Not only do we have an extensive search engine, but each week in our newsletter, we post a sampling of questions from viewers like you, as well as my answers.
Now take a look at this delicious looking pie. Well, there's a surprise key ingredient inside that pie crust, and it has something to do with the color green. I'll tell you about it coming up. You know, viewers are always so kind to send me recipes, recipes I've enjoyed over the years. One in particular comes to mind when I see green tomatoes. It's from a gardener in Kentucky named Evelyn, and every time she has a surplus of green tomatoes, she puts them to good use in a green tomato pie. It's delicious. Now, if you'd like to make this pie, these are the ingredients you'll need. Four cups of thinly sliced green tomatoes, lemon juice and rind, salt, cinnamon, sugar, cornstarch and butter, and of course, a double pie crust. You can get the details on putting this together on my website, and trust me, it's not only nice to look at, but it's a tasty treat using green tomatoes. There's nothing like the flavor of fresh homegrown tomatoes. If I'm gonna make that green tomato pie, I better get started because these are beginning to ripen. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Now, any of the information in today's show can be found on my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile